All right, Luke 21, here we go. Luke 21. As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said. This poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. This series called That's Genius is we've been discovering the genius of generosity. And today as I close it out, really I'm going to talk about ultimately one main thing. You see, what Jesus is revealing here, and he wants everybody to know it, is this. When it comes to generosity, it's not the size of the gift, it's the size of your faith. Quite clearly. It's not the size of your gift, it's the size of your faith. That's what he's illuminating. It's not the size of the amount that you give. It's the condition of your heart and your trust in God in it. So it's not about the size. It's about the sacrifice. And here's the genius of generosity when it comes to faith. Generosity actually is a catalyst to faith. Because in giving generously is a faith commitment. It's a faith decision. It's something that you go, okay, Lord, I am trusting you by me having this posture. And when I step out in faith and I am generous, it enlarges my faith. And as my faith gets enlarged, so does my generosity. And then my generosity in being enlarged requires my faith to be enlarged. As my faith gets enlarged, my generosity gets enlarged. And as my generosity gets enlarged, I feel I need to step out in faith and my faith gets enlarged. I'll stop there. Do you see it? They're intrinsically connected because when it comes to humanity throughout history, that whole posture of what we have and trusting God with what we have is a huge catalyst to faith. As we've said before, God blesses generosity, not always just direct to you, but he blesses generosity. Last week, God loves hilarious givers. He loves it. Scriptures are revealing that he loves it when we give that way. Because he's designed it that we become the conduits of his goodness, the conduits of his grace. We are never more like Jesus than when we are giving and forgiving. We're never more like Jesus than when we are giving and forgiving. Now, before I dive into this faith thing, I wanted to state something that we don't often think about. We know throughout history and humanity, and I picked it up in week one, that the reality of our stuff is a big idol description. And it's also an idol distraction. So let me just declare this. What is the number one enemy or opponent to me being generous? What is the number one enemy, the number one distraction, the number one opponent to generosity. And when all is said and done, it comes down to one word, and it's the word greed. And some of you are thinking, yeah, but I'm not greedy. Greed's very subtle. We use the word greed, and it sounds nasty. It sounds mean, and nobody in here will go, I'm greedy. We don't do that. But greed's subtle. We don't even realize that greed is a motivator. And when I talk about greed, here's what it is. The craving for more. That's what it is. It's this, but what if there's more? I want some more. This is nice. Can I have some more? We're enjoying this. What if we had more? And it's a subtle thing that's always shifted us towards that. And it's a result of which the craving for more always means we never are satisfied. And some of you in this room, I know, some of them, I'm totally satisfied. That's awesome. But for a lot of us, sometimes this, this is good, but I want another one. I want some 
more. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not about not having good things. I'll get into that today. But there's a difference in our heart. The opponent to generosity is me wanting more. Because if I want more, then why would I give it away? Then it's an opponent, almost an enemy to generosity. So with that being said, how do we beat it? How do we defeat that craving? How do we defeat that enemy that has us thinking, but more and nicer and better all the time? And as a result, we're never satisfied. How do we beat it? The scriptures have got a lot to say on it. I'm going to go to just a couple of places today. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 is where I'll start. Ecclesiastes, it's been said, was written by, at the time, King Solomon. Now, King Solomon had more King Solomon was extremely wealthy. He reigned in a time of unprecedented peace. He'd built things and completed temples and he'd palaces and all that was there. He was renowned around that known world of that time. He had so much. He's known and meant to be given this wisdom title, although he had multiple brides, which doesn't seem wise to me. Gazillions of them. And he had more than enough you could possibly imagine. And Ecclesiastes is said when he was writing it towards the latter days of his life, this wise king, this king who got everything you could possibly imagine. And here's verse 11 of Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done, he did a lot, and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Now, some have thought that when Solomon was writing this, he was having a bad time. He was having a sad day and he was having a wine. But at the same time, he was reflecting. When I surveyed all that I had done, everything I'd built, everything I'd toiled over, everything I'd given so much to, it ended up, ended up just being meaningless, but here's the phrase, a chasing after the wind. The number one way in which you defeat the enemy of the subtlety of greed when it comes to generosity is stop chasing after the wind. It's an incredible image, chasing after the wind. I mean, it sounds foolish, doesn't it? There's the wind, I'm going to chase it. You're not going to win. It's a meaningless toil, a chasing after the wind. Let me just put this. Wealth is not condemned in the Bible. Solomon's wealthy, David's wealthy, Abraham's wealthy. All throughout the Old Testament, we've got this opportunity of God bringing blessing through wealth. In the New Testament, there's landowners and business owners and people enabling the expansion of the goodness of God to take place through their wealth. People selling things and giving it all. Incredible. Wealth isn't the thing, but the pursuit of satisfaction in it is the enemy. There's a difference It isn't the, oh, wealth is bad, but the pursuit of wealth for your satisfaction is a chasing after the wind. Stop chasing after the wind. Stop chasing, but more, but more, but more. Secondly, the way in which we defeat the opponent of generosity that's greed is this. Refuse to view generosity as depriving yourself of something good. Let me look at it this way. When we think, well, if this is what I have, this is what I've got, this is all that I have, if I give some of that, then I lose. I've got less. Simple math. I've got less. So for me to be generous, I need to deprive myself. And so they view generosity as deprivation and generosity is viewed as loss and generosity is viewed as this false humility of, oh, I need to increase self-pain in my life in the aim that God will smile. And so if we view generosity from a deprivation perspective, this is where the enemy of greed is subtly kicking in. Well, this is all I've got and if I give it, I've got less. And if I've got less, then oh... 
It's a mindset and a view that the scriptures actually talk about. And once I've given it, I've lost it. So I've got loss. I've got loss. I've got loss. I've got less. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. It's on the screen, but verse 17 through 19. It says this. Command those who are rich. Pause. Some of you are sitting here thinking, I'm not rich. Um, Can I just give you a subtle reality here? Because it says, command those who are rich in this present world. Every single one of you in this room are rich. And I'm not just talking about the richness of your soul. I'm talking about your finance. You're rich. You live in the top 2% of wealth in the whole world. In the whole world, by definition, living here right now, you're in the top 2%. We continue. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. Here we go again. Which is so uncertain. But to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. If you've got a deprivation mindset, you're missing the heart of God. You're missing the heart of God. Of course he wants you joyful. He has no issue with you not enjoying. God is a good father. Enjoyment and laughter and hope and joy are good things, but it's not where we find our satisfaction. But they're good things. But he wants that enjoyment in there. Then he goes on and says this, command them to do good and to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. The kingdom of Jesus, generosity is not about deprivation. Generosity is the doorway to grace-filled investment. You don't lose. It's not a loss. It's investment. It's always about more. And it's not even about you. It goes way beyond you. It enlarges your faith. It enlarges your view of the kingdom. So then let's quickly now go and have a look at actually what does Jesus say? But what does Jesus say? Directly his words. We've already heard him talk about the widow in her situation, which I'll pick up shortly. But look at this. I'm going to give a couple of verses now that have been quoted by prosperity gospel people so wrong so many times, I want to put the record straight. But also, I want this to really make you go, oh, wow, this is genius. Luke, chapter 6, verse 38. Luke 6, 38. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, Shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. This has been used many a time. So if you give, you will receive so much more. With the measure you use, it'll measure to you. You'll, you give this you, and you'll, you'll be so wealthy. Your, you, this is, and it's been a, Jesus said it, give and it will be given to you. Is that what he's talking about? You see, we read that with 21st century Western eyes. But let's go first century. And when Jesus said that, he does this description of this, a good measure and pressed down and shaken together and running into your lap. They knew exactly what he was talking about. So let me just, agrarian wheat collectors in those days. Here comes the harvest, here's all the wheat, and the workers did it this way. They get a basket, and they are to get the wheat and put it into the basket, and each day then take it and tip it into the main vessel. And they keep doing that, fill the basket, go, fill the basket, go. Some of the workers, by definition, well, I'll make the basket as light as possible to make my work as light as possible. I just keep doing it. But the way in which they got a bonus, at the end of every week, the last basket was theirs. 
the last basket was all theirs. They got to keep the contents of the last basket at the end of the week. Jesus, is, this isn't the context of him speaking about all things Sermon on the Mount based, all things loving enemies and judgment, all kinds of stuff, forgiving others, all of that. And in that drops in this. He's picking up a context and a culture of you want to receive so much, yet you don't want to serve well. Easy for you, get all that I can. But at the same time, with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. It is about contribution and serving, and it is about you giving, but we want all of this, but we want to just give this. He's leaning into it, and then he says this, the last basket of the week, imagine. Imagine if we know, hey, it's last basket time. All week, I've been keeping my basket nice and easy. Now it's the last basket. How full do you think I'm going to make it? He said, this is, how you're gonna, this is what you do with that last basket. A good measure. I'm feeling it. Pressed down. I'm getting that wheat and I am packing that thing in. I'm not making it look full. I'm making sure there's nowhere but wheat in this basket. I am pressing it down. I am shaking it together. I'm going to get as absolute maximum as possible, and it can be overflowing. I'm going to fill that thing. See, that's the heart of God towards you. He's not got a poverty mindset. He's not got a minimalist mindset. He's got a mindset that is abundance in all things, rich in every, every aspect. That's his mindset. But that hope, I'm going to do as much as I can. I remember back in England, there was this place you'd go for a restaurant where there was an all-you-could-eat salad bar, but it was one visit. You got a bowl, and it was one visit, and you got a bowl. I had to learn a technique <laughs> of maximizing the bowl. You don't put your lettuce at the bottom. You put the potato salad for a firm foundation at the bottom and the coleslaw. And I would pack this thing in and I would raise it up and I'd get the sliced cucumber to make the bowl rim higher. And I'd slice it in and get that around the outside and layer it up so it would be taller. So the inside, and the bowl was maybe this deep, but my salad was this deep. You know, and I'd put it all in and people in my family would be embarrassed and, but I don't care. I would just like load this and I'd come back to the table like a trophy. Like, look at this. And I'd put it on the table and it would spill over. But hey, because I wanted as much as I could get for what I had paid. Anyway, the mindset is in those days, I think the people did the same thing. If this is for me, I'm going to get all I can get. But Jesus is teaching this. He said, but with the measure you use that you've been using all week, it'll be measured to you. The heartbeat of giving is not just, guys, it's not about all that you get. It's about all I can give. It's a mindset. It's a lifestyle. Forgiven, you'll be forgiven. Judge not and you'll not be judged. Love your enemies. He's going to it all. You can't just isolate this. Oh, give to God and you'll be rich. So this is what he's pressing into. As I said week one, what I keep is all I have. But what I give, God multiplies. And it's not just about multiplication into my life. It's his kingdom. It's a bigger mindset. It's a greater life, a greater opportunity. So this is about an image of the generosity of the Father heart of God. And it's an image of the generosity of Jesus and an image that he's calling us to. He's saying the way to live life is not just all about you. So I've been talking about it for a few weeks and I think it's about time we experience generosity. The genius of it needs to be experienced and for many of us, and that's a fact, it's a, it's a fact for the Western world, that for the most part, it's a lower percentage of people who live with this genius. And we're never going to know the genius of it unless we experience it, unless we live this way. So the way in which we step into it is faith. This is the, the, the barrier is this trust, it's a 
faith issue. Yes, it's a heart issue, but it's a faith issue. It's that moment of, I wonder what it is when you give everything away. Can just, if God calls me to that, will he come through? You've been in that situation. What, what, but, but it's all of that that takes place. But for some of you, this is what it comes down to. One of the many Old Testament names for God is the word Jireh. And the word Jireh, people just think Jehovah Jireh means the Lord my provider. That's not English rich enough for the depth of that Hebrew meaning. Jehovah Jireh isn't the Lord my provider. Jehovah Jireh literally means the Lord's provision shall be seen. There's a reason he wants to provide because it shall be seen. There is something faith-filled, but the only way you experience that is through faith. So the things I've talked about, and I didn't use these three words this year, which I have in previous years of how we give. We give systematically, and then we give spontaneously and sacrificially. I'll pick them up briefly, but let me remind you of week one. It starts with what is first. So for you to encounter and live in the genius of generosity, it's got to start with what's first. This is what I have, and I give to the house of the Lord first. It's a biblical principle. I give first. I'm not going to get into amounts right now. I'm on about your heart, and where is it from, and whose is it, and give first. And some of you, that's your action, and you've got to do it, and you need to step into it. Do you trust him? There's the faith step. That's what you need to do. Set that up first. Back in the day, the early church were, at, on the first day of the week, they brought their offering. So we traditionally used to have, hey, you bring it on a Sunday. They got, because they received real hard cash. So you bring your cold hard cash, and you give it. And now through different electronic means, but you can have it even systematically set up for you. This is when I get paid. This is what goes. I'm going to give first. It's a hard thing. All you college kids, give first. You need to set it up. Forget the amount. Get it set up. This is what I'm going to do. Jesus first. God first. If you're a Jesus follower. If you're, if you're not, he just wants your heart first. Forget your wallet. He'll call for that after. But he wants your heart. He's got so much more for you. I'll get into that shortly. But he gave first. He gave first. When it comes to generosity, the whole Christmas story, which I pick up from next week, is there's this stairway of generosity in the Christmas story. And we actually think the ultimate giving was Jesus giving his life. I challenge that. I challenge that. You think the ultimate giving is giving of one's life. I challenge that. Parents, come with me on this one. Would you die for your children or would you want your children to die for you? Therefore, the ultimate giving was the Father in heaven who gave his one and only Son. Jesus himself gave of his very life. But when it comes to generosity, it's so incredible. And we get to enter into a season where love and hope and joy and peace are encountered. And it all comes from the overwhelming love and generosity of our Father in heaven. Unbelievably so. He is God. The kingdom principle of first from week one. Step in. Step in. It isn't a leftovers thing. It isn't a when I remember thing. Do all you can to help with that procrastination issue. Do all you can to help with that distraction issue. Do all you can to go, well, what if? Just set it up. Give first. That's systematically giving. And it's strategic. But then last week I talked about becoming a hilarious giver. Hilarious. We often see hilarity in generosity through spontaneity moments. There's just a moment and you feel that, that pull in your heart from the Holy Spirit and there's a spontaneity moment. You know when you're a hilarious giver when you go, oh, I get to do this. I want to do this. It's so good to do this. I know it is more blessed to give than it is receive. I become a conduit of God's goodness and his grace because he loves 
hilarious givers. Bible says so. The Lord loves people who give that way. And for some of you, that's what you're, the Lord's calling you towards that. He's calling you towards your giving has become ritualistic and routine. He's calling you up in to become a hilarious giver. I shared it a couple of weeks ago. I'm not there yet and I want to be. I find myself distracted and holding back. I find myself having a little element of Scrooge now and again. To live in the hilarity of being a cheerful giver is a call towards. And here's the thing about that. The beauty of that comes out when you get this sacrificial giving. And sacrificial giving is that that's how we defeat the enemy of greed. We defeat the enemy of greed through sacrificial giving. The widow had already made a decision who was number one in her life. All she has is a couple of copper coins. She brings it and Jesus picks it out. Jesus picks out this as she gave unbelievably. Her heart was all in and she gave it. She gave it. I would like to know, 2,000 plus years on, we're still talking about her. We're still talking about a woman who had nothing. We're still talking about a woman who culturally in those days had no source anymore. She's all by herself. She's desperate, but she's going to go to the house of the Lord and she's going to give all that she possibly can. And we're still talking about her. And to this day, it's like, oh yeah, and there's going to be some people in Tempe, Arizona, thousands of years on from here talking about me. And I was just, why would I not give? Amazing. The sacrificial isn't about me losing and deprivation. It's about freedom, actually. It's more blessed to give than it is received. There's no chasing after the wind. There's no loss, deprivation mindset. It's incredible. And I was reminded of this this week. If I was to ask you, do you believe it's more blessed to give than it is receive? When it comes to spontaneously giving and sacrificially giving, some of you actually may be on the receiving end and some of you go, oh, no, I can't receive that, I can't receive that, I can't receive that. I, I was once in that situation. My family was once in a situation where we were being blessed by somebody who was in a greater crisis than us. We were being blessed by a family in extreme crisis. This family opened up their home to us and were generous with everything that they had whilst they were going through a horrific crisis of their daughter dying, their two-year-old daughter dying. And we were staying there. We didn't know this all the time. And after a few days of being there, and we learned the magnitude of the story and the magnitude of the moment, we were like, wow, we are receiving all of this and they are in a crisis. This doesn't seem right anymore. Maybe we should take alternative measures. And so me being the coward that I am, I went to this family, the, the, the wife in the house, and I went to her sister. And I went to her sister and I went, look, you kind of know that we're staying here for this time and this is what's going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we discovered the magnitude of the crisis that they're in and they're being really generous at this time, but this doesn't really seem fair. Uh, and, and so, like, we, we, maybe we should move out or whatever. And I remember, guys will know this, when a woman gets right here in your grill with a stern face you know you better make eye contact. <laughs> and I remember her saying this to me, and she said, so do you believe it's more blessed to give than it is receive? Number one, what question do you give, answer to you give to that? Do you believe that it's more blessed to give than it is receive? Yeah, <laughs> do. To this day, I won't forget it. Don't you dare remove a blessing from my sister's life. Looks like we're staying. Don't you dare remove a blessing from my sister's life. And their daughter died three weeks later. That 
That's hilarious, Gibbon. Their posture was just give. And I was forever changed. What's in the way for you when it comes to that in a week like Thanksgiving? So there was a man lost in the desert. He's lost in the desert. He's run out of water. He is dying of thirst. He's about to die. He's dying of thirst. Then in the distance, he sees some trees. And he sees some trees in the distance and thinks, maybe there's water. There has to be because the trees are growing. Maybe there's water nearby. Maybe there's an oasis of water where the trees are. And as he's walking towards it, his hope for that water is there. And he's looking towards it. And as he gets closer and closer, he arrives at the trees and there is no water. But there is a pump going down into the ground. A water pump going down into the ground. And two objects by the pump. There's a jar of water and a piece of parchment with instructions on the paper. He looks and he sees and he thinks, water, this is what I need to save my life. It's just an amount of water. But the instructions on the parchment say this, with this water, pour all of the contents out onto the leather gasket of the pump. In so doing, you will release the pump and you will have an endless supply of water coming from the pump. But you must pour out every last drop. There's just enough water in the jar to get the pump to work. And you'll have an endless supply of water. And when you have all that you could possibly have needed, please refill the jar for the next traveler. And he's faced with a situation. He's dying of thirst. And what's in his hand right now could possibly satisfy that for a little longer. He could drink this water and he may not die of thirst yet. And he may have enough to get him through. Maybe, maybe not. But right now he is dying of thirst. And all he can see is what is right in his hand right now, which is the jar of water. But the writing says... Empty it out. And in so doing, you will be supplied with more than enough. And then you get to supply somebody else in the future. But what if that gasket has been dry for so long that he ends up pouring the very one thing that he thinks he needs onto the gasket and it doesn't work? Then not only does he not get water from the pump, he doesn't get water, he's going to die. So why would he take that risk? Why risk pouring it out because he needs this right now? What does he do? This is a faith decision. Does he trust in what he has or does he trust in what is written? Does he trust what he has in his hand right now that he believes can supply his immediate need or does he trust in the words written? What about you? Is your trust in what is in your hand right now as your, is your trust in his word you see, it isn't just his words. You see, the word has a name. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, verse 14 of John 1, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, as Eugene Peterson says, and the word became one of us and moved into the neighborhood. His name is Jesus. Is my trust in all that I have? have or is the genius of faith my trust is in him and in so doing for more to come behind the hope of faith is available to them I don't know what the man in the desert did it's just a story but what about you and your life right now and so I want to simply put it this way. Today, I want to pray with you. 
and for you as I pray for myself in this whole area of the genius of generosity. For some of you, the Lord is calling you and you still go, but what if I end up pouring out and I have nothing? The question is, do I drink or do I pour? And so when it comes to giving first, some of you, there's a bit of a barrier. There's a bit of a hesitancy. There's an element of I'm taking a faith step. You see, we walk by faith, not by sight. It is by faith that you've been saved through grace. It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Without faith, Hebrews 11:6 6 says, it is impossible to please God. This is an opportunity. But there's a bit of a barrier. So for all of you who are embarking on the give first and you're going to break a cycle and establish a new way of living and this is going to be your way for now and into your whole future, then today is a day you need a breakthrough. I want to pray with you. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to come out down front and we can pray. For some of you, the rest of it is, no, you want to move from systematic giving that has become religiously ritualistic. In its goodness, that's good, but you know the Lord's calling you to become hilarious. There's still an element of this that he wants you to do this with. And it's quite frightening for you. And the Lord might ask of you something that you're thinking, oh, but to drink or to pour. And so for some of you, the Lord's saying, this is, this is the season I'm calling you to. Do you want to come on the adventure of becoming hilarious in your generosity? And you feel that, and you're like, I don't know how to do that. I want you to come down front and we can pray with you. I, I need a dose of that prayer, me personally. I need a dose of that. And then thirdly, for some of you, you know, the Lord's saying, actually, what I'm asking you to do right now seems really sacrificial. It seems really sacrificial. There's a big sacrifice to play, but the Lord's prompting you and you're like, Lord, enlarge my faith, enlarge my faith. And so you come down. The reason we pray with people is because where two or three are gathered in his name, he is present and we get to bind on earth and we go, okay, here we go. On earth, Lord, we declare this into the heavens. There's a calling on this person's life to make to do something sacrificial and they <sighs> And whenever you've been in a situation where you've quite literally had to give away all that practically, realistically, all that you have, there is a moment. We, we've been there as a family. There's a moment where you go, oh, it's all gone. And, and you need prayer. You need prayer because your flesh is saying, don't be foolish. So if that is you today, I want you to come down front and to pray. Pray and then take action. Pray and obey. Step into it. So while I'm talking right now, if this whole area of that's genius and there's an area of your life that the Lord's saying, hey, let go, trust me in this, trust me in this, and you're like, I really want to. Well, come down, let's pray about it. Let's pray for a spiritual breakthrough from the idol of stuff to the throne of King Jesus. And let's pray about this and lean in. So the band will not come out until the people are down here ready for me to pray with. So come on out where you are. If we've got prayer partners and leaders and staff, you also come down so we can pray with these people later on. So make your way out right now. If this is you, that whole area of this generosity thing, there's a breakthrough. If some of you college kids have yet to be generous, get off your whatever and, and come on, break through it, break the cycle now because it gets harder. It gets harder. But if this is something that you believe, this is what the Lord's wanting. You want to live your life in such a way that you're like the widow. Or you want to live your life in such a way you're like Barnabas. When it came to expand the kingdom, he went, I'm selling the family heirloom of this land. I'm giving it all to Jesus. You want to be like Mary with the alabaster jar of perfume, this family heirloom of extreme expense, and she wanted to pour it out on the feet of Jesus. You want to live extravagantly like that towards God. Then this is an opportunity for you to step into that. Or maybe you're in a crisis right now, but the Lord is saying, hey, what about other people? But I'm in a crisis right now uh, how can I give right now but the Lord saying, no trust me in this trust me in this in your pain bring some joy if that's you I want you to come down so we can pray with you I'm not going to labor it I'm going to count to 10 in my head 
invite you to come down so we can pray with you. Let's pray for the rest of you out here. You're not spectators, you are cheerleaders. You're not spectators of this. You get to pray and you get to push back the forces of darkness in your prayers. Our 24-7 prayer where you go online, you register. That week is every hour for seven days, people will be praying. And that's it. But this is practice to dive into that. So let's pray. All of us down front, let's pray. King Jesus. We give our lives to you today, Lord, and we say it all the time, but Lord, for us down front right now, for some of us, we want to step into you first, you first. Lord, we give to you first. Would you help us to break through, to create a new positive rhythm of it's you first, God, because you gave first. We love because you first loved us. And King Jesus, for those of us today who are, we want to be set free from the the distraction of stuff for us and to live with a heartbeat that is hilariously given. We want to live with the anthem that we know it's more blessed to give than it is receive. Your word says, freely you have received, freely give. And Lord, we know it's about our heart and our posture and it's about you and your kingdom. Lord, it's not about our bank account. It's about the expansion of your kingdom and it's about our hearts being fully devoted to you. And for those, Lord, who are being prompted to step into something sacrificial, enlarge their faith now in the name of Jesus. Satan, your shiny distractions, we rebuke them in the name of Jesus and we call upon heaven to help us live in obedience sacrificially. We trust you, we love you, we give to you, Lord, because you ask us and you are a good, good God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Kind of during this last song and just after all you guys down front, different staff and leaders and prayer partners will come alongside you and pray with you. So don't leave till someone's prayed with you. Other guys, just be active and just make sure and just do that. We're closing with Living Hope this morning. We haven't sung it for so many months. It's the gospel. It's the generosity of heaven. The generosity of heaven that is our hope poured out to us. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks, everybody. See you next week.